Hello. It's October 2017, and this is episode 80 of the Unseen Podcast. This is your host, Paul Carr. And on the panel tonight, we have Adam Smith. Hello, Unseen listeners. (laughs) And Sam Lichtenstein. Hello from New York City. And our special guest is Jake Robbins of the We Martians podcast. Uh, Jake, how, tell us a little bit of your, about yourself and how you guys started in the We Martians. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I got into space a little late. Um, I missed the window for astronaut training. You have to get started pretty early on that, I hear. So, uh, you know, I kind of got into a lot of different space things. And, and uh, you know, for most people, that's something simple like Kerbal Space Program or just reading headlines or whatever it is. And, and, you know, I fell in love with it and uh, I knew I had to do something more than just kind of, you know, follow it. So I had been getting into podcasts at the time and I wanted to start it out. So it seemed like the perfect match for two different hobbies to come together. And so I just kind of threw it together. I didn't really have much of a plan and uh, went from there and got some people to come and talk to me, which is a a big boon. And here we are. I want to point out now that it's we one e martians not we martians <laughs> not like little martians just like <laughs> yeah and, the- and i've been listening to it for a, about a year now and it's it's i uh the reason i invited you jake is i thought this, this is a quality show uh, and i think before you there there really wasn't at least not that i'm aware of a really good mars focused podcast so uh, yeah and, and i would second that i i would say there's you really filled the void in the podcast ecosystem <laughs> well that was the kind of the goal because i and I, I did think about that i said i don't want to just have another space podcast and so i kind of thought about how can i find a niche and specialize a little bit and that was the idea i came up with and it seems to be going over well i guess so yeah i really appreciate it I and mean, people have been so nice to uh, just to come and listen to me every three weeks it seems kind of bizarre to me and and uh, so i'll always be thankful for that well also americans like the chance to hear from Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like to to serenade you with our bizarre accents and Sure, yeah. We just love it when you say out oot instead of out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not that bad. It's not it's not a boot, but it's maybe a little bit a boat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh there's been some a lot of Mars related stuff going on lately. Uh um, yes. And uh, now you have you were on Main Engine Cutoff, which is another podcast I like quite a bit. Uh, quite recently, you talked about the future of lots of things, uh, and then we had uh, Elon Musk's talk in Australia last. Uh, well, I guess it was uh, late last Thursday night or Friday morning, uh, and uh, changes to the. Uh, the big friendly rocket. Uh, so um, help us get oriented. What's, what's, what's going on exactly with all this talk about SLS and the deep space gateway and uh, all these different Mars plans that are being surfaced. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're talking about a human, human space flight, I think is what you're, you're getting at. right? Yeah. Yeah. Is, primarily. SLS deep space gateway. It's, it's a, uh, it's a very complicated complicated thing right now and i think if if it was simple enough to answer then then uh we wouldn't have as much debate over it right now but i mean for anyone who doesn't know it's it's kind of the the idea of of where do we send people next like what's the next uh exploration goal so uh nasa has put forward this idea for the deep space gateway which is um, kind of in line with their strategy for the last call it six years which is capabilities approach right so they say we're we're not trying to commit too much to one destination. We just want to build, you know, a good rocket and a good spacecraft and, you know, a nice space station and whatever the political winds say is what we'll do with it is what we'll do with it. And that way we're not going to get canceled. Like they keep getting over and over again. And then you've got this whole new dynamic now. And, and that's with the, the sort of commercial space or, or, you know, some people will call it new space, but, but what they're really referring to is this idea of maybe a fixed price contract, right? So SpaceX is the number one player that comes to mind with that, but they're not the only ones. Blue Origin is going to be 
um, a big player in this. And um, you've got a lot of smaller companies, so things like Moon Express or, or you know, countless other ones, really. And, you know, they're saying, well, we can do this and we can offer to you at this price, so why don't you come with us? And the conflict is that some of that hardware is competitive and it's, you know, one will make the other redundant. And so the question is, which one do you ax or which one do you buy? It's complicated. Well, when you say make that a redundant, like... Sorry to interrupt, Paul. Uh, I, I, okay, somebody else was talking. I, I missed it. But... Are there any Canadian? Sorry, to, sorry, to, sorry, Paul. Chris, I'm aware that of uh, companies that are involved in this program and this competition, but um, what about Canadians? Are there any Canadian companies that Americans may not have heard of who are involved in the uh, this latest round of space competition or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great question. I'm I'm happy for the opportunity to Canada. Um, the a, a startup Canadian side, at least at the level of say SpaceX, is not really there yet. I mean, there are some private. Um, uh, uh, companies uh, trying to open up a new launch facility in Nova Scotia, which is, uh, um, you know, on the on the East Coast. So that's one thing that's happening. But I think that the most, you know, remarkable Canadian achievements in space right now are, are bigger companies who have been around in a while, but maybe doing things that aren't as, as flashy, right? So, uh, y- you know, the the most notable thing that we're known for is, is our arms, our robotic arms. So uh, we flew the first one on space shuttle in, in the 80s. And then uh, is now on the space station right now, you know, uh, docking things like the SpaceX Dragon capsules. And uh, we've even got this this really cool one called Dexter, which is, you know, basically multiple arms that can literally crawl across the, the outside of the station and do remote repairs. And, and I think that in this new round, uh, Deep Space Gateway, they are um, they are studying the idea of maybe getting where it's on Canada Arm 3 or whatever you want to call it. We'll, we'll be on that. I don't know much about this, but I even read that there was a Canadian company trying to um, uh, push an idea of a solar sail on the deep space gateway, which is the idea of having just, you know, solar electric or not solar. Funneled into, you know, propulsion to kind of do, you wouldn't be able to do big maneuvers, but you could do station keeping and and alter your orbit slowly over time. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Although I should mention that I think Elon was bragging recently about uh, getting free of Canada Arm um, in terms of uh, removing Dragon's dependence on Canada Arm for docking with the with the say say thing, right? Yeah, because the the original Dragon capsule, the Dragon One, which is what they're using for cargo today, that doesn't have autonomous docking capability. So it basically flies up next to station, and the station catches it and berths it to a, a port. Dragon Two won't need that. It can fly in just like a Soyuz and, and dock you know, autonomously with the station uh, in a direct connection. So yeah, that makes uh, the arm redundant, at least in that capability. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I respect the Canada arm. We all respect the Canada arm. <laughs> well, I mean, that, but that's, you know, the Canada arm has been out there for, since I, since I was a kid, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm about, about a kid yeah. of about uh, 25, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, we've always had the Canada Arm on. Uh, we had it on the shuttle before we had it on the space station, and uh, yeah. and uh, so it's it's a very mature design that you know. If you ask yourself, you know, why would you, why would you, if you if you could use it to dock, why would you not do anything else? You know, but uh, unless. You know, you're trying to dock to a port that it can't reach. So. Yeah, because the the ports on station like they are different. So a, a docking port and a berthing port are literally different connections. So um, you can't dock to a berthing port, and you can't berth something to a docking port. So you, you do have to kind of consider that. Yeah. So uh, now the um, let's see, we, how do we get off on the can? Oh, we, you asked about Canadian. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh. The company I used to work for very nearly bought out McDonald Detweiler, <laughs> but that was that was a uh, that was squashed by the uh, Federal Trade Commission for some reason. Uh, but 
the, and now uh, they're they just their merger, right? So um, yeah, NBA is you know, part of something called Maxar. I, I read so that's more more changes. Yeah, well, I mean, that, there's there's uh, I even got some calls a, a number of years ago from some Canadian companies that were willing to hire me. I thought, well, that's odd. I thought you didn't hire Americans, but uh, uh, they wanted me to come up to uh, up th- up there and. and uh, and I think it was for yeah, it was for McDonald Detweiler. Uh, so they were they must have been hiring pretty aggressively at that point. But uh, and and they've done they have radar set, which I think probably the public doesn't know that much about. But uh, yeah, the, the radar technology is pretty good up Canada. Yeah, um, and the lidar too. So if you think about um, the Osiris Rex mission, which is you know just flew by Earth a week or two ago and is on its way to. The asteroid venue, the lidar instrument on there, which is like the laser altimeter, it's a Canadian instrument. So we're good, yeah, good at radar, good at lidar, good at arms. <laughs> and uh, actually, and then the if if we're going to talk Mars, then uh, yeah, the wheels for uh, like the whole um, locomotion system for the ExoMars rover coming up is is a Canadian. Uh, again, it's uh, MDA making that, so that's a Canadian contribution. Yeah, uh, the. Uh... Now the uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about quite a bit was uh, um, in look beyond the deep space gateway and dragon and so on was some of the nearer to mid range uh, plans for getting people permanently on Mars. Not uh, not everybody is is okay with that, but. Uh, Elon Musk came out last week saying we're going to start sending people in four in six years. Yeah. Uh, now we all know that SpaceX has a history of setting unachievable schedules. <laughs> yes. And and, and so it's still still achieving the objective, but not they they have a different calendar than the rest of the. <laughs> Yeah, the joke the joke is that it's Elon time, and it's the same multiple of an Earth year to a Mars year, right? So it's like you know, about two to one almost. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that may have entirely been what he was talking about, you know. <laughs> but uh, twenty twenty four is you know that in NASA time twenty twenty four is next week. <laughs> yes. In yeah. in in, uh, in commercial space time, that's six years. That's a long way off. So there's yeah. a, there is a different way of perceiving things because there's different ways of doing things. Um, there's a, there's a pr- approach that, that accepts risk and an approach that doesn't. Do, do you think really risk is, is primarily the, the dividing line here? Uh, well, it's probably, yes. I, if you're to make the point that the risk analysis is different between so a company like SpaceX versus NASA, that yes, it's true. Um, I think what it traces back to is is a more a more political, um, you know, foundation because NASA has been burned by that's not a very good word to use, but NASA has 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 you know experienced the the consequences of of when the bad side of risk shows itself, right? So. Uh, you know, they lose seven astronauts in the Challenger accident in 86, and they lose another seven astronauts in, in the Columbia accident in 03. And the, the political ramifications of that are, are very, very tough for NASA to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, there's maybe a more aversion to risk on the NASA side, right? Because it's not, it's not politically sustainable to, to lose an astronaut like that. The commercial side could possibly, you know, move quicker and, and, and overcome that differently because they don't have to rely on on uh you know congress people writing their budget so it's in that sense yes there's definitely a a difference in in how you you calculate risk and and how much risk is worth buying down right so if you look at it in very cold you know calculating terms or you don't talk about human life you you might say something like how much money like when do you get diminishing returns on the money you spend buying down risk? So if we wait another year and do that much more safety testing and put this much more R and D into safety devices, um, how much percent less risk are you going to have? Right. And, and at, at some point it's not worth the money anymore. And finding that point is the you know thing that no one wants to talk about. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, 
um, the, the diminishing returns are, I, I, I think, the, oh, oh, by the way, Nick Nielsen just joined us. Hello, Nick. Uh, you can, you can unmute your mic if you like. Hello, Paul. Hi. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain, it's, it's also cultural, right? I mean, after a while, an organization builds into their process a an aversion to risk and a uh, a an aggressive approach to beating down risk, uh, and the perception of the diminishing returns for the efforts uh, are different, right? Because a lot of that is is looking forward to the future, and it's uh, everybody has a cloudy crystal ball. <laughs> Right. So if, if I say, oh, look, I look at this and I say, yeah, there's a risk there, but, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll be all right. And the other guy says, well, you know, we, we, we spent millions of dollars and did lots of analysis and we think the risk is 2%, which is too high for us. You know, w in reality, that number is just, a, is only meaningful in a relative sense. It, it doesn't really mean the risk is 2%. It just means that that's sort of the belief factor of, of what they think the, the risk, how likely the risk is to materialize. For ex and, you know, we look at, for example, uh, radiation levels and cancer. We don't really have good human data on low to medium radiation exposure versus cancer risk. Uh, and the, uh, so a lot of that is just simply perception and then the question is okay you know if you go to mars you're the odds of, of dying somewhere on the trip out there are probably about five percent <laughs> maybe 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 worse than that so you know how do you balance that against your risk of dying 20 years later from the radiation exposure and that's the sort of thing that different people will approach differently depending on their their biases uh and, and if you look at say the mars one people they say well damn the torpedoes right <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, we're taking that risk because we, uh, just like, you know, we're the, we're the Marines. We're the first ones in, we're going to take casualties. Uh, and to a certain extent, I, I have to say, I kind of admire that point of view. There, there's, there's, there's a, you know, there's a, a sense that if we don't take the high risks, we'll never get the high reward. And yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's something you have to kind of weigh in the sense of like there's even in, within one organization, sending people to Mars, for example, would have sort of two parties examining the risk. You're going to have the organization sending people and then you're going to have the people going. So, uh, you know, if you look at the people going from that perspective, we're absolutely going to need some very courageous uh, risk taking people to be that first group that goes. Right. I mean, there's no question that. That, that those people are going to enter that mission with an assumption of I'm doing a risky thing. And to me, it's worth it because what we can accomplish is, is, is good. Um, so that's obviously going to happen. But then from the other side of the, of the organization sending people, there is still a responsibility to, you know, do what is within your power and within, you know, your, your, your resources to protect them as much as you can, right? So that's kind of where that diminishing returns happens. If I can spend $1 to buy down 10% of risk, that's worth it. But if the next 10% is $5 and the 10% after that is $1,000 and that final 1% is $10 billion, that, that last 1% may not be worth it, right? So you have to kind of right. figure out, and, and as technology develops, that curve moves, right? So you're always trying to kind of, figure out where you're at and, and what's worth it and what's sustainable. And it's, it's a tough decision. Like I, I do not envy people who have to make those calls. So. Right. Uh, when Virgin Galactic had its crash in 2015, that pretty much set their program back about two years, I think, which is comparable to what in the public sector, the space shuttle program was set back at least two years by the Challenger disaster. So from that example, it doesn't seem that private enterprise is, is, is 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 more ready to take on risk than than the public sector? Well, That's a great I, point. I don't think it's a question of what when you take on risk. It's more as you know, what does it take to fix your problem? You know, uh, and uh, the the uh, and also how much funding do you have uh, to fix the problem? The the 
you know, I remember, I remember the Challenger disaster very well. I was a young engineer working on shuttle satellite programs. And, uh, the one thing I do remember is that when they did get it flying again, they did not have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to get astronauts to go. They had plenty of people who wanted to go. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, they knew they all, they, I'm sure they were all a little nervous. It, we sure we got this thing fixed, but uh, you know, no more attention had never been spent on, <laughs> on that particular problem than, you know, any other problem in the, in the shuttle history, just, you know, that, that one problem with, with the, with the O-rings, uh, you even had Richard Feynman working on it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that you got to figure that one, that one was solved. And that let's move on to the next, uh, you know, next challenge. And so, and I think a lot of people said the same thing. I would go tomorrow. I would, I would get on the other shuttle and go tomorrow if they asked me to. Um, and, uh, so, you know, th there's always, there's always people that will storm the beaches of Iwo Jima, uh, f because they believe in what they're doing. And there's other people that won't. Well, the astronaut problems that don't have a problem with recruitment. They have a problem with paring back the number of people who are, who are willing to storm the beaches. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, and, and I would say that the dangers of going to live on Mars are probably comparable to storming a beach in the Pacific. Uh, you know, but we still had men who did it. And, uh, well, they were drafted. Well, a, a lot drafted. of the Marines they were volunteers. Were, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, and you know, to, to Nick's point, uh, uh, and that, you know, Virgin Galactic did take, well, I mean, they're not they're not back really yet, but um, it did take quite a while to, to recover from that. And there's, there's different factors that play into that, right? I mean, uh, in the NASA case, they didn't have to wait for another spacecraft to get built, which is a, you know, a big, a big part of that. But uh, I'd, I'd say that something like Virgin Galactic is still a very, very, very new space company, and they probably don't have the the institutional rigor to 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 figure out. I mean, they they had to figure out what caused the accident, and they also had to figure out how to figure out what caused the accident, right? So they're learning everything from scratch. Whereas you know NASA at the time of Challenger had already almost 30 years of experience and had dealt with you know the Apollo One disaster. So um, and they had another shuttle almost. I think two was Discovery around by that time. It might have been, yeah. And so they had, yeah, oh, the, uh, four, 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 four of them were built already at that point. So they had two more or three more. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, there's different factors that play in there, but it's a, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting discussion to to have as to you know how how do these different types of organizations handle that differently? Yeah, and, and uh, is entry, sorry, Paul, well, tree descent and landing going to be the biggest risky. Thing that astronauts do going to Mars, do you think? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, in, in terms of danger per minute, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we may see that, as, uh, as Paul mentioned, that the, maybe the cancer gets them all later, but uh, in, in terms of what's going on on that mission, that EDL sequence will be the scariest, scariest part. And I know that wherever I am at, at that time, I'll be watching with, you know, not a lot of breathing happening for sure. Right. I smiled watching uh, Elon Musk's presentation when he, he hand waved away the velocity from Earth to Mars. He just waved it away and said, we're going to do some aero braking when we get there. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you could, you know, put an aero braking plan in there. Maybe they do a, a couple a couple of orbits of, of Mars as they slow down, but, uh, it's well, still uh, aero braking is, is pretty much, uh, a common practice now with Mars. Uh, it, it can take months. So that's, or, or years in the case of ExoMars. Yeah. Uh, but, but you don't have years if you have, a uh, people, uh, but, uh, yeah, but if you've got a launch vehicle that's already punched through a much thicker atmosphere. You could do aero braking. Uh, it would take some, I, I wouldn't, I'd want, wouldn't want it to be, have people on board the first time you try it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you could do it. And I'm, I'm not sure how the math plays out, but uh, if you compare something like a, um, you know, so the Curiosity rover landed in kind of the typical uh, Viking aeroshell shape, which is 
basically just, you know, you're hitting with a flat surface and, and taking all the heat at once. But if you can get in a more aerodynamic vehicle like what SpaceX is proposing, I don't know if they can spend more time in the upper atmosphere and try and gain some lift and spread that heat and that energy out over time. Maybe their EDL sequence isn't seven minutes of terror. Maybe it's 12 minutes of terror or 15 minutes of terror. And and, and that can significantly reduce the amount well, of- Well, they know, can also do, uh, they've learned how to do- uh supersonic retro burns so they can they can uh they can actually do something that nasa has never been able to do which is a break while supersonic and that's uh that's something that i don't know could be could be a game changer yeah it very well could be yeah because uh right previously there's been um a uh, a lot of discussion of how, how we're going to scale up. I mean, what, what Curiosity did, for example, was clever. It was all get out, but it doesn't scale up that well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, just like the airbags on the smaller rovers, Opportunity and Spirit and, and uh, Pathfinder, clever. But at, at some point you've built two, you built, you can't build a bigger airbag and solve the problem. So uh, also, you probably wouldn't want a, a load full of people going down on one of those airbag things. That, that, oh, have you been to Six Flags no. recently? <laughs> <laughs> They'll do it. Trust I'd me. I'd love. <laughs> I would love to do that. That would be great. Can you imagine landing on Mars in a big beach ball thing? Oh that yeah! Would be Boom! Whoa! We! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, everybody put their hands up in the air when that happens. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't. Um, sometimes I wonder if the biggest engineering accomplishment of, of like spirit and opportunity was just keeping the rover not broken as it bounced like you know 30 times across the surface or whatever it was well it uh, it was a remarkable engineering achievement just getting those those rovers down yeah safely um and uh it the problem is it's one of those things that's hard to repeat hard to get repeatable hard to yeah. get to where you can do it routinely uh it takes so much engineering content uh, that it, it's not, I don't think it's ever going to be the, this, it might be a way to, they might eventually use that as a way to bounce down cargo. Uh, but maybe yeah, if it's small enough, right? Yeah. But you know, maybe cargo that's already been staged in orbit or something, you just bounce it down. Uh, yeah. but the problem is it, it rolls and rolls and rolls in unpredictable ways. And it could end up kilometers from where you want it to be. But, it might, that might be I fun. haven't yet had, I haven't yet had an opportunity to see the newest Elon Musk speech. So, did he propose a new landing vehicle for Mars? <laughs> well, it's 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 essentially, you know, it's it's last year light. I guess is what you could call it. It's it's, it's slimmer. It's gonna be a little bit smaller, and uh, but generally, I would call it mostly the same same concept, at least for for the people side of it, right? Yeah. So it's gonna be a propulsive landing on its tail. Yeah. 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 Okay. Which I think, I think that's until like, somebody comes up to something incredibly radically clever, that that's going to be the way we're going to do it for a long time. Uh, well, once you can build a, once you have a population on Mars and they can build a landing strip, you know, why not something like the Virgin Galactic thing? I know the air atmosphere is very thin. You would need much bigger wings, <laughs> which I don't know where you're going to get them. But the wings wouldn't weigh as much. So you could get away with bigger. Well, wings. the atmosphere is, what about one percent, and the gravity is about thirty-three percent. So yeah, you uh, need thirty-three times as big a wings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I thought it was. Go on, go on, go on. I think I think that uh, given the amount of energy you have to dissipate and the and the unwillingness of the atmosphere to cooperate in that, uh, you you probably have uh, you're going to have this propulsive landings for a long time, I uh, think so. and and. Uh, I don't see a problem with that, really. Uh, it, it, until until we come up with a, uh, uh, the yeah, uh, until, right. until, until we come up with with something, uh, you know, that's far beyond anything we have at the moment. Uh, which I, I don't I don't know what that is, but uh, you know, right and now we we know how to mix things until they exit. A, a, a nozzle with high energy and and uh, that's where you're going to get 
the uh, I mean, it's just it's just physics. There's only so much you can do. Yeah. Uh, the uh, but now what I think I thought was really interesting about Elon's talk was he kind of pivoted a little bit, and he said, oh, and and I don't know if he specifically said this, but how are we going to pay for this thing? This is obviously going to be very expensive. Uh, yeah. One way is to use it over and over and over again, right? But that's not the only strategy. Now he's saying we're going to use it as a point-to-point transport on the Earth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, if you ask me, the the point-to-point uh, transfer thing is is more. Um, it was the it was the carrot for people that came to see some magic that day. Um, it's something that that is going to take a ton of development and then additionally it's going to take a ton of regulatory change and and you're going to need to get multiple levels of government on board like that that's that's going to happen long after the spacecraft is is operational if you ask me i mean so if if you're talking about the you know how do we pay for this to me that the big news is, is the consolidation of the fleet right so you're taking falcon you're taking falcon heavy you're taking dragon wiping the slate clean saying that this spacecraft and this rocket will do all of that. And therefore the flexibility uh, will help us, you know, pay for the R and D and, and pay for the, 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 well, changing it all over. Right. Uh, well, you know, I, I've had since I was a quite young, this fantasy of getting in a rocket flying off into suborbital and then landing somewhere, you know, and ha- having like this roller coaster ride, Combined yeah. with a, you know, with a plane trip, and the first time I flew to Tokyo, <laughs> which was fourteen hours, I got <laughs> really burned into me how how much people would be willing to pay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something makes me wonder if if uh, you know uh, Elon Musk landed in Adelaide after his however many hour flight and said you know got on the horn and said get me a video of this spaceship doing point to point because i'm never doing this again <laughs> you know that's entirely possible that's that's a that's even longer than tokyo that's way down there it's a very long flight yeah yeah what when I, when I i used to work a, uh, a... Oh, go ahead adam i'll save my my anecdote for another time <laughs> these are going to be rockets for rich people right yeah. Point, point kids going to have any impact on ordinary people's lives? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's the kind of thing that once it becomes realized, it'll start for, I mean, so look at, look at the business model for, for Tesla, right? So if you want to see how this will probably play out is that the very first Tesla is a luxury vehicle. It is not affordable for regular people. There is limited supply and you get the elite that come in and, and they, buy the first round that funds the second round and the second round's a little bit cheaper and then there's more people that can get it on and on and on and now you've got model three which is you know starting to eke into i'm in line right- for a model three yeah uh, <laughs> uh i would never have bought i would never have bought the s it's just you know not yeah. worth paying that much for a car but because uh, i have to send my kids to college someday you know but uh <laughs> soon actually but uh the um yeah that's exactly right i mean tesla has Drop their price. I mean, they've obviously it's not as luxury as a car, but it's it's come down by almost a factor of three. It's, yeah, it's now within range of middle class people like myself, uh, especially those of us who would like to get off gasoline permanently, and uh, and you know you can even buy Tesla's roof. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got another least... fifty grand sitting around, nothing to do, and and. Uh, you know, power your car with it. I don't think the I don't think the point to point uh, global transport though will ever uh, will follow that model just because you know we've had robust uh, supersonic transport for decades and that couldn't even be made to break even and it made the airports excuse me the airlines so gun shy about even producing another one even though we've got much better technology that we that we had when the when the Concorde is produced, no one is willing to produce a supersonic, much less a hypersonic uh, jet right now. Well, they are looking and, at that, but uh... well, they, yeah, there, there are there are uh, many companies who have stuff on the drawing boards, but they're not funding it. They're not even making test beds, with a few exceptions. Well, part of the problem was that uh, uh, 
you know, we used to have something called the supersonic transport uh, funded by the U.S. government. It was canceled for a number of reasons, one of which was uh, sonic booms. But, uh, you know, the sonic booms weren't that bad. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people might be willing to accept that. But, you know, if, if you it's not everybody who gets on a plane in London and flies to Tokyo. It, it's it's probably but, but, but it, there is a regular traffic. There's a regular traffic. There's a, there's daily flights that go to places like you said, like Adelaide, and to connect the major. Oh cities yeah, it's regular traffic. But in terms of, it's not ordinary people, right? It's people that can afford the five thousand dollar round trip, or whatever the you know it is. It it's uh, or, or people who who've been flying so much they can cash in a lot of frequent flyer miles. But uh, the you know, but people who like say have say live in the U.S. and have relatives in India will do that trip once a year. They'll save up their money and they'll do it. So, if they can get it down uh, into the ten to the fourth dollars per trip, I think they've got a winner. But what I'm saying is that's going to happen first with with some something like a supersonic or hypersonic plane, and it, that's always going to be cheaper than the point to point rocket. Uh, well, at some point, a hypersonic plane is a rocket. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and many people in, in, when, when they're in the early part of the space program thought that the future of the space program was supersonic, uh, planes that would fly higher and fast faster until they eventually went into orbit. But we need to, when the Apollo program was proposed, it needed to leapfrog that. So we went straight to ballistic rockets. Yeah. Well, you know, the, actually in some ways the technology, uh, for, Point-to-point -point rocket is actually easier than hypersonic. Uh, it, it it's uh, pretty much all that technology exists. So th the question is, uh, you know, it just has to be scaled up. Whereas flying at say Mach 10 on a either we don't have the technology or nobody's telling us we have that technology uh, because the temperatures that you have to the engines hit, uh, you know, ingest, ingesting air is incredibly high. Uh, that problem was solved for about Mach 5 in the 1960s, but, uh, you know, since then, it, it, it's been a pretty hard barrier to get over. And, you know, so I, in a certain sense, it's, uh, it's probably easier to fly, actually fly a rocket. Yeah, um, and I would add to that. So one thing that, that you know, if... Here, I'm going to I'm going to advocate for this system, which I don't know, would know, probably not normally do. But, uh, you know, one thing that SpaceX's point to point travel would have is that the flight time difference is so great. I mean, if you think about Concorde, what Concorde could do a transatlantic flight in something like what, three, three and a half hours or something, which is great. You know, it's better than five hours or six hours, but it doesn't really it, all it does is make that transatlantic flight better. If you had a. 40 minute flight time from New York to Tokyo, it is now less time to get on a train in Miami and go, you know, 10 hours to New York and get on this, this rocket and get to, to Tokyo that way. Right. So you will actually absorb a sort of a hub of traffic that can drive into the city. It's now worth it for people in, in Boston to drive to the New York airport. If they're going to go to Tokyo, it's now worth it for the people in, you know, Columbus and Nashville and, and all these places that are that are still within a couple of hours of that trip. So you will actually have a pretty significant hub of traffic and that will drive demand uh, a lot in my opinion. So you would only have to deal with this sonic boom problem in a few key hubs. You, would, you wouldn't set up <laughs> landing pads at you know every airport in, in America and around the world. Yeah, and there are, there are some traffic issues that have to be figured out and other things like that. Uh, you know, the, the pad has to be clear uh, before you take off, but uh, the landing yeah. pad, uh, yeah. and there can't be any traffic around it. Uh, and, you know, or it, it could, you could have a really bad day. Uh, so, uh, you know, but, but still, I mean, it only has to be clear for 45, 40, 45 minutes. And yeah. then uh, you're down and you're in another hemisphere uh, halfway around the world. Uh, and, uh, but, your leg, your legs still work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. And you got to go through a zero G. Thing. You uh, could have zero G uh, flight. a band. Oh. Yes, you could have a band play a concert 
in uh, say you have a band playing a concert in London at 8 p.m. They could do their gig, book, play a concert at eight o'clock, fly to LA, have a bit of a rest in between, you know, play it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Play a gig at eight o'clock and go right the way around the world doing that. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you could do a world tour in a few days. Uh, <laughs> Not, not, not a terribly bad idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The ability for for you know high high performance individuals to be everywhere at once would be greatly improved by that, right? It would be mode of choice for for dignitaries and 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 you know world leaders. It would be there's a, there's a lot of it's one of those things that's so like it would change so much that it's hard to imagine the ramifications. It'll cascade all the way through our lives. I, I talk a lot about this a lot with. Um, uh, self-driving cars and it's more than just i don't have to drive anymore i can i can work on the way to work it's that, that you know the ramifications of self-driving cars have ripple effects far throughout the economy and, and i think that this this kind of transportation system would also have that uh, pretty significantly yeah i i agree um let's get back to mars okay uh and you talked to a lot of people about mars in the last couple of years that you've been doing this podcast uh where do you think uh, humans to Mars, what do you think, uh, A, what do you think is uh, a realistic scenario for the numbers of people within, say, the next 20, 30 years? And then uh, can we ever get a fully self-sustaining colony going on Mars? And how do we, a, a, and what will that look like? That's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah, 20, 30 years, it, it's tough, right? Because we still, we still don't know the technology that's going to take us there. So I, I always like to think that whatever the first human presence on Mars looks like will probably be modeled very closely around what we do in Antarctica today, because in a weird sense, it's, it's very similar, right? Antarctica is a inhospitable, cold, dry area where nothing grows and, you know, hardly anything lives. And we go there because there's scientific merit to it. There's a lot of you know things we can learn about the Earth if we go to Antarctica, but that's kind of it. You don't go there to grow crops. You don't go there to start businesses. You don't go there to you know do anything really but science. And so Mars is essentially the same thing, and and that's kind of how I see it playing out. So if you talk about 20 to 30 years, assuming we can figure out the transportation in say 10, um, you know I would probably count on seeing the first year or two as as a small group four to six and then at best you know within 20 years you maybe double triple or quadruple that and i think you know antarctica today you know i would probably count on two thousand people in in the in the southern hemisphere's summer so that's after 100 years of uh 100 yeah about 100 years i think we're at now when did i'm trying to think of when shackleton went there and that was uh, world war one right so it's about 100 years ago um that we've been doing that so that's kind of i think that's what i would expect to see Okay, so you think Antarctica is a, a, a better model than, say, uh, the Oregon Trail? Oregon Trail, yeah. Um, it, yes, I do, because you're not going to have a financial incentive to go to Mars. No one's going to go there to make their fortune individually. Uh, I think companies will may be able to, to make a living off, off you know, infrastructure and science there, but you're not going to have people going there to seek a new life. Anytime soon. <laughs> well, I mean, for example, a lot of the people that went west uh, didn't go to make money to get rich. They went just to start a self a self sustaining farm uh, where they could feed their family, and uh, that worked, right? I mean, you have, you got Kansas and Nebraska and Oregon and you know uh, others uh, were more ambitious, started things like mining and. And other, you know, uh, things they were able to sell back to east. But uh, a lot of people went just because they the, the prospect of getting uh, all this unclaimed land that that was they could they could farm on. Uh, the yeah. east was east was getting crowded, and uh, they went. And uh, many of them took horrible risks and didn't make it. But uh, 
and, and likewise, when the when the U.S. was well, it wasn't the U.S. then when North America was first colonized by Europeans, many of them did not come over in order to sell tobacco back to Europe. They came over. They didn't. Even, in fact, they didn't even know tobacco was going to be the killer app, right? They they uh, or cotton. They 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 just came over. Like the Quake, the Quakers came over just to get away from persecution. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, I, it, I mean, it's interesting. Go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, religious organizations haven't quite picked up on going to Mars yet, but I, I think that's something's future. It's just as the, as the Quakers settled North America. The first year we might see, I don't know, the Mormons or whatever religious, you know, branch of Christianity or Muslims even, you know, starting a new life on Mars. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the tricky part with that, and, and I, again, I'll, I'll draw this point, is that even if you're just trying to get away from what you have here, and, and that is either a legitimate goal or not, or depending on who you ask, but even if that's all you want to do, you still need to have something better or the belief that you're going to get something better on the other side. And, and right now there's no way to make a living on Mars. There's no way to live on Mars without being completely, you know, financially bound back to earth. It, it's, it's unsustainable at this point, And that won't be solved anytime soon. It's, that's, I guess, at the point that I'd try to make. Well, is it possible that to solve that problem? Do you think, uh, you know, with, I mean, what what there's free energy, right? There, there's, uh, there is uh, material. There are materials. Uh, what's missing? Well, I think you need that sort of. You need that cash crop. I mean, that's kind of what it's got to be, right? There has to be. And uh, maybe it's a mineral that we don't know is is in abundance there. Maybe it's it's uh, maybe we get to a point where where water becomes the new oil. You know, where where water is, is so valuable that that going all the way to Mars to get it is still profitable. Like it has to be. There has to be something to to drive I think, you know, and, and people to want to do it to make their lives better, right? And so right now the only thing that that is is science, and and because science is such an you know the funding for science is always very constrained these days that's that's something that, that mars exploration will have to live with until it can until it can solve right um by the way if, if you're watching live i think oh we dropped down to one viewer uh if you have a question or comment uh you can put it in the chat or you can tweet uh to uh at podcast unseen using hashtag uh ep80 uh, so, uh, we'll be looking for that. Uh, if you want to have a question or comment for, for Jake or anyone else on the panel, um, uh, Adam, I, did I cut you off earlier? I'm, I'm sorry. But, uh, oh. Adam's muted right now. Oh, but I was beginning to say that of, of the, early companies that specialized, well, began to specialize in, uh, the transatlantic voyages, the first generation all went bankrupt, and some of them went bankrupt like two or three times. The the Dutch, the Dutch company that financed uh, some early voyages to the Americas went bankrupt at least twice, uh, and they all went bankrupt at some point or another. And I would expect a similar model in in any interplanetary context where, yeah, a lot of people put a lot of money into hopeful projects. The first generation goes bust, and it's only the second generation that finds their killer app like tobacco that makes it possible to do something like this on a sustaining basis. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And and those companies went bankrupt after they figured out how to make the ship that could cross the ocean. So, uh, to give you the idea of, of where we're at right now, we still haven't. We're still in the canoe and the rivers on the other side, trying to figure out what to do about this ocean, right? Right. Well, we know to cross the ocean with very small ships, right? <laughs> but uh, with no people on them. But uh, it's like a, it's a message in a bottle, right? <laughs> well, we're getting very good at that. You know, at some point you ask, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, when when do we when do we get to go? Uh, and and maybe that's maybe that's a purely emotional question. Maybe it's not. Uh, yeah. 
but but I think the emotional questions are what drive a lot of things. So, yeah, yeah and that's a, a great point. I mean, uh, I I podcast about Mars and kind of with the full realization that you know I probably will not be doing this by the time we actually send people there. I get you know I I don't see at this point myself doing a podcast for thirty years, right? So. Um, it, it, you never know. I, I, I think that the, the robotic exploration is very, very important. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that the podcast will be about that, but like you say, it's still an emotional question. And the idea of sending people to Mars still really excites me and I follow it and I, and I do want to encourage it, but uh, you have to also be realistic about what, you know, what, what is, what is the right step to do today? If we ever want to get to that place that satisfies your emotional needs. Right. Yeah. And we also have the same, question we always run into is who's who's we right uh, right uh, is is we a nation is, is we everybody is we some private individuals uh uh i like to use the the, the royal we in the sense of that it's 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 humans i mean i think if we want to be successful in in and, you know, starting a colony on mars by that point we need to be much more united as a human race across this planet okay um. I'm worried, quite frankly. I'm 50. I was 50 years old uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Must I'm be, getting a nice bit worried. Be young, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, what worries me is that our generation, Paul, aren't are not going to see the first people on Mars. I mean, we don't know how long we're going to live, obviously. But I think I'm going to be in my 70s. Well, yeah, the time. Uh, no, yeah, and I turned sixty in a in a, a few months, and uh, I have the same worry. Uh, the main reason I want to live longer is to see what happens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I and, wish I, I want well, you know I want uh, people to develop cybernetic implants for people and send me up to a, an old people's home in orbit. <laughs> I, our generation's just going to miss out. Well, yeah, I know. And, you know, when I was when I was Jake's age, I was very optimistic about how we were going to do. And, and, well, you and, and me both. And, and I, because I grew up with the, the Apollo, uh, I was 11 years old when Neil Armstrong set his foot, first set foot on the moon. Uh, I was about 11 months. And uh, so I remember better than you. Uh <laughs> I was so jealous of him. I wanted to be that. I wanted to be him. And I thought, well, okay, you know, we're going to go from here to lots of people on the moon, to lots of people, to, to a few people on Mars, to lots of people on Mars. By the time I'm 60, you know, there will be regular uh, trans Mars flights that you can, you know, you, you take like, just like you take a flight to, to, uh, you know, any to Los Angeles, you, you, you take a flight to the, to Mars, uh, and it, you get there in a couple of months, and it's, uh, it's it's kind of more like getting on a cruise ship, really, but a very small craft yeah. cruise ship. Uh, <laughs> uh, more, actually, a lot like when people used to sail across the Atlantic, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I can that will happen, and I, and, I, and I'm gonna I, I'm going to go into that field because. I want to help make that happen. And, you know, it did not happen, obviously. Uh, we spent, what was it? 30, 30 years going around in circles. In lower Earth. Literally. Yeah. yeah, literally going around in circles. Uh, and spending enough money to go to Mars doing that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it... Uh, we can, we can, you know, we could analyze forever why, what kind of failure that was, but it didn't happen clearly. So, uh, but maybe we are at, at that point now where the technology is mature enough, and the we have an understanding how to make it low low cost enough that we can start thinking about how to make it really make it happen for real. Uh, because real is it political it, will we need then? No, because I think. Uh, we don't have any evidence for anything that political will has caused other than the flags and footprints sort of thing. 
Well, I, I, I don't think there's any question that the Apollo moonshot was a question of political will, and it happened at a lower level of technology. And I think you're looking at two different scenarios. You can have really a political will that makes something happen at a lower level to technology, or you can wait until the technology becomes so inexpensive and so broadly based that a small group of people can do it. It doesn't require political will. It just requires a small group of people who can afford a ship and do it themselves. Well, so these are two two very different scenarios. And if a Mars mission happens now or in the next 20, 30 years or further, it's going to be a different Mars mission that would have happened if if the Apollo program had continued to be functioned and the Werner von Braun plan would have been fully unfolded and we would have gone to Mars in the 80s. Yeah, we would have gone to Mars in the 80s, but I think it might have been another flags and footprints sort of. Yeah, exactly. Thing. It would have. You know, and, and if I can add, uh, I can take a, a pretty different take on that, and and it, the the last the last Apollo astronaut, so Gene Cernan, called the Apollo program, a, you know, a uh, a decade out of time, and what he meant by that was that we went way earlier than we really thought we did, right? Uh, we, we way earlier than we we think we probably should have, and and there was. As you mentioned, a lot of political rem or reasons for that. It was very geopolitical that the space race happened. It, you know, Kennedy wasn't a space geek. He he maybe became that and maybe found that love. I'm not sure, but he started that because there was geopolitical tensions that that motivated it. And the fact that the Apollo program's budget spiked to something like five percent of of the American budget, like that's I love space and I and I want to have as much money as it needs, but five percent of the budget for a space program is kind of insane, yeah, even yeah, in today. That, right, it'll probably so, never happen again. Uh, it, it probably won't, and it probably shouldn't. So, uh, what I like to think about, and this maybe this is just to make myself feel better, but the interim period between Apollo and now, which is often criticized for failing to live up to its predecessor, maybe we should be more thankful that that even happened at all, because because Apollo kick-started it we had to do something and the fact that we were able to do anything at all in that interim period imagine if apollo had never happened if if you know let's say the soviet union collapsed in in 1952 or something and it never it never materialized would we even be in space at all right now it's tough to say right um and we certainly wouldn't have been doing a you know a reusable spacecraft like the shuttle as early as 1981 so what you kind of have to think about is is that Apollo is an anomaly, and trying to recreate it or try to try to live in that past is probably a really futile exercise. It's just going to make you frustrated and angry. I think the the better use of energy is to think about you know how do we remove the barriers to space today? And and Nick, you called it up precisely. I mean, you, you want to get the cost in, down enough that you don't need Congress to to bless the space program you need just someone who says i want to do this round up a couple of buddies get a couple of hundred g's together and, and now i've got a cubesat in space right that is the to me the most exciting part of what's happening in space today is that it is you know it is becoming accessible to 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 more people and doing so very quickly and, and that's how we're going to get off this apollo funk yeah and, and i agree with you i mean it it's just that the history that you can't undo the history, right? I mean, uh, and the whole generation of people that whose expectations were raised by that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which I am the poster child. Uh, but but uh, the, uh, you know, the the uh, and I think the costs have come down. The costs of doing a lot of those things have come down a lot. Uh, although they did some things then that we still haven't caught up to uh, as well. I mean, we're starting slowly starting to recreate. Like their ability to build a, they built a the the uh, the Apollo lunar landing engine was a, was a work of art, uh, mm -hmm. and you know we're just now getting to where we can build an engine that good uh, again uh, because they put enormous amounts of money and talent into that thing, uh, and it was a generation of really good engineers who built lots of very impressive things that are some of which are still in use, and uh, the. Uh, so we're, we're to this point where, uh, yeah, we, we have got costs down a lot and also, you know, I, and just in my, over my career, I've gone from seeing how fast an engineering group can put a complex design together, test it on a computer 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and through many iterations and refine it much more rapidly than we could back in the 80s uh, when we were running things on we on batch programs on IBM mainframes. Now we're on a, a little $2,000 PC. You can do much more than that faster and do many iterations and get it really highly and, and more precisely and get it more highly refined faster and push a button and the thing becomes a part that somebody knows how to, you know, it becomes numerical control machinery. Somebody can build it. And that, that sort of thing that, that has been this quiet revolution uh, where we can now the stuff that SpaceX is doing now, they're uh, landing a booster that, in principle, could have been done in the 60s, but it would have been a huge program. Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, to, to even take that that thought a little further, they absolutely could have done it in the 60s, and they kind of did because the Apollo lunar lander was a rocket engine. That yeah, but it didn't have to go through an atmosphere. But uh, No, but, I mean, so the, the problem, though, is that it, it was a tough problem to solve, and it didn't get them to the moon faster. Right. It just made it cheaper to do so. And that wasn't a concern. The, the, the point wasn't to figure out how to go to the moon very cheaply. It was to how to get there very moon very quickly. Right. So, yeah, again, kind of why I think that Apollo is such an anomaly. We need to stop trying to recreate it. It was not a market driven endeavor that, you know, the 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 the, the cost of that program was absurd, considering, you know, what what some of the stuff we know today. Right. We can. Do it, so. Yeah. I mean, what what SpaceX has done there their booster reuse for uh, would not have been that, that kind of, it, like you said, it could have been possible back decades ago, but it would have been a far, far more expensive program. Uh, and, and the guidance electronics <laughs> would have been the size of a Volkswagen. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, they have this little box that can, that does all this exquisite steering all the way down and, and drops you yeah. within a meter of where you wanted to be. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that kind of technology is with us now and SpaceX are not the only people kind of only group who know how to do it. Uh, the university that kind of technology is now cheap and widely available. Yes. Now it does take a certain amount of art and skill to make it work, but, uh, there are people that can do that in every country on the planet. Uh, it, it's, it just takes a, a little education and a lot, a lot of hard work. Uh, and, the uh, and you know we have things like GPS and really really good inertial guidance systems and really really good star trackers now and uh, that can be obtained for under a million dollars and uh, well of course they don't use star trackers to land the booster but you know that the the fact that they can do it at all is uh, it is testament to a lot of the infrastructure the technological infrastructure that's been built up over the last 40 50 years. A lot, a lot of it, not with, not really with rockets in mind, just with faster computers in mind, or, or better, uh, better information handling, and, you know, when I started out in space uh, in the early '80s, uh, the processors weren't really even processors; they were just bit bangers that might have had four kilobytes of RAM, and now we have, yeah. you know, we have. We're flying gigabytes, uh, and uh, routinely. And uh, you know, I was at a, a big design review last week, and there was nothing particularly remarkable about what they presented. Uh, but it was considering that it's typical, c comparing that to what it was possible in the '80s, it's so much more sophisticated, and moves so much faster, and. Uh, even following a pretty rigid process that slows everything down, it still moves faster. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we are getting to the point where we can do it for le less cost. Uh, and that that's and we're about to hit another point where we can do it even cheaper, where we have machines that can do a lot of the a lot of the grunt work for us, uh, more or less automated. And so it, it, the dream that, that my managers had back in the 90s of pushing a button and getting an answer, that, that of course, was absurd in the 90s. It's now becoming more and more realistic. And maybe 10 years from now, you'll be able to say, 
I want an engineering system that does X. And the computer will say, I need a little more information. Tell me this and that and the other thing. And a month later, you've told the computer everything you want in enough detail for it to figure out the exact solution. And it goes off and does the solution. Uh, we're not that far from that. And, and that no. will accelerate design and man, and manufacturing and test uh, by another factor of two or three. And we'll have, be able to go from here's what we want to here's what we need. And here it is <laughs> instead of in four or five years in four or five months. And, you know, so we're getting, we're getting to that point. Yeah. And you don't even need to, to dream up these big, you know, these self-designing systems. Like I, I, you're right. We are going down that path, but it's, it's even simple things that are, that are improving the cost of space. I mean, just, uh, just a week or two ago, Lockheed Martin announced that they've, you know, consolidated their satellite fleet and they've got kind of a standard assortment. There's a, you know, a little satellite and a medium satellite and a big satellite and an interplanetary satellite. And there are common components between them. So they can just make one battery or whatever. And it's the same battery in all their systems. So they can drive the cost down because they've got mass production on that. Little things like that, which are, you know, very you know, that's not a new manufacturing idea. That's something. That no, we, we were talking about that a lot in the nineties. Uh, yeah. And, and so actually we did, like, we did a lot about it in the nineties, but. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's just, you know, how long did it take to get to space? Because you needed the, you needed the market to, to grow to a size where you needed that, that competitive edge. Right. I mean, if you, if you're comparing yourself to, to 1958, when they're, starting to put together the F1 engine to send Apollo astronauts to the moon, you know, they weren't thinking like, well, let's design it this way. Cause then the, uh, you know, the, the combustion chamber can be used across all these other engines that we're going to be sending other people to the moon. Like that's not, it wasn't a consideration. Right. So it's really exciting to be around today. I think where, where this technology is, is just growing in the, in the scale of, of who can have it and who can use it and, and what kind of uses you're going to do with it. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap up pretty soon, but I just wanted to, uh, I know you, you've spent a lot of time talking to people about uh, what it would be like to live on Mars for the first people that actually live on Mars, uh, you know, whether they're there just for two years or for 20 years. Uh, let's talk about, you know, uh, we've all seen the National Geographic special and all that, uh, and of course the Martian, but is there, do we have a realistic sense of, of what it's going to take to, for people to survive and live and work on Mars? Well, I mean, the, the truest answer I could give you is no, we don't. We, we don't have that idea yet. And that's part of, of why we need to keep studying things. I mean, it's going to be tough either way. Uh, I'll, I'll continue my, my Antarctica analogy and say, look what happened to the first people that that went there right it's it was a tough life lots of people died and and they uh you know <laughs> they got stranded there and they they got rescued and all these kinds of things um today we'll, we'll we'll be managing those risks a little better so i don't expect some sort of you know cascade of lost expeditions on mars or anything like that but it's certainly going to be tough right and the the first few visits there are going to be purely about like okay, does all the life support work and, and is this livable? And then you'll collect a, like just a, a, a huge amount of data and bring those data back and, and try and understand, okay, well, how do we make the next one better? And it's just going to be an iterative process. So it'll start out tough and, and it'll get easier, I guess, is the, the only thing I can tell you for sure. Okay. Uh, Nick, do you have any last final comments? I was very intrigued by a photograph that I saw on several media um, uh, outlets last week, and I'm not sure if it's a new photograph or one that was just released of a, of a sinkhole on the Martian surface. Uh, do you know what picture I'm talking about? I I might know it. it uh, I'll, 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 I'll send a link. Uh, in any case, um, it's just a perfectly nice, uh, round, well, not perfectly round opening, but it's a nice big round opening. You can see a shadow, so it's going all the way. Uh, there's an underground chamber there. And obviously, uh, one's mind jumps forward to the possibility of, could we just put a, a thick plastic cover over that and uh, 
spray foam on the inside edge of, uh, of the inside of the crater and, and make a place to live there. Uh, um, how, how far away is, is something like that? Yeah, and that's that's a, a, not a new idea either, right? Because uh, Mars has a lot of lava tubes, and and we we know that, and so there are certainly places underground that we could we could make into homes, and that's also a high value science target, right? Because um, probably many astrobiologists will tell you that uh, uh, underground on Mars is is where we're going to find life if it's there. So it's a, it's certainly something that we should be considering. Uh, I don't think the first expeditions will be doing that because. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the, the first person to to jump underneath this thing, spray some foam, and then risk taking my space helmet off. I, I'm not sure if that's that's for me, <laughs> um, but it's something that we could certainly test, right? But yeah, and, again, and, it probably and, depends know, on. And, and the National Geographic Mars, they, they find a they find a sinkhole down there, right? With that's got uh, water, ice, uh, a very deep sinkhole, exactly. and and they use that for. Uh, their habitat. They don't seal it. They, I think that's that's probably asking a bit much to get that much pressure in a big sinkhole. But uh, they they do they use it to get away from the radiation and the thermal extremes and to get water. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, There's tons of benefits from doing that. Like you said, yeah, water will be a big one because there are probably more of it deeper underground, and uh, radiation is a huge problem. And yeah, thermal extreme. So it may not get really hot on Mars per se, but the fact that you go between night and day with that little atmosphere means that the, the temperature swings are crazy. And so your your hardware all has to be very, really durable and, and uh, that's tough on stuff. So, okay. Uh, we have one question. From, uh, uh, gosh, I can't pronounce his last name. Lucas Sayum. Oh, sorry, Lucas, if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, how will we make Mars economically viable? We've always already tried to kind of address that, right? Uh, you want to add any, any further thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so, so much is that we just, we need to find out if you can answer the question of, of why do you want to start a business on Mars? I think you'll have that answer, right? That's always what's driven human endeavor is, is finding resources. So whether it's to resources to consume yourself and start your own farm so you can live, or it's resources to sell to others back home, it's 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 one way or another. You want to find something that you can you can use there. And so once we solve that, that's that's your answer. Yeah, and we often uh, in the history of us, we go we go off there thinking we're going to find one thing and end up finding something else altogether, right? Uh, uh, tobacco, tobacco, uh, not so much spices, not so much gold, tobacco. Right? <laughs> And exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of people in Europe got rich off the tobacco that uh, from the New World. Uh, okay, well, sorry, Lucas, if that wasn't an in-depth answer, but uh, we'll, that's a conversation we need to keep having, obviously, uh, for a very long time. Adam, how about you? Any further thoughts? I have one last question for for everyone, and that's uh, who will put the fir the first. Footprints, Mars, and when? Hmm, that's a uh, you, you put your uh, your reputation on the line when you try and make a prediction like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not going to pan out for another 20, 25 years. So give it your best shot. Well, based on all the data I have today, I'd be comfortable saying that it's probably going to be an American citizen. And uh, that's about all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, I okay. have to say I wouldn't. I wouldn't I'll be stunned be if it was a Chinese or Indian person. Uh, yeah, yeah, fifteen, I mean, twenty years from now, change. things can change. But uh, yeah, based on what I know today, yeah. uh, Nick, Nick, you have a um, you have a prognostication on that. See it's, I, <laughs> if I had to stick my neck out, I would also say likely an American citizen. Uh, but if if SpaceX is the one to get there first, they might choose to do a stunt and and uh, and you know, pull a wild card out and put a very unlikely person with the first footprint on Mars. That wouldn't surprise me a bit. And I would love to see it happen uh, as early as the late 2020s. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. If, if the will and the money 
is there. <laughs> mm, that's, okay. that's optimistic. Okay. I'm going to be much braver than you and be more specific. I am going to say uh, in 37... <laughs> First, will be an astronaut called Abigail Harrison. <laughs> oh yes, I, I, yeah, I follow her Twitter feed. Oh yes, she wants to go to Mars real bad. <laughs> astronaut Abby, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, astronaut Abby, I hope you're listening. Uh, you just got promoted to uh, first first person on Mars by by the uh, famous Enlightenment social philosopher Adam Smith. <laughs> you hit it here first. <laughs> okay, uh Jake uh of the We Martians podcast. Anything uh first of all, uh tell us a little bit about what's coming up in your podcast and then uh any final thoughts you might have. Yeah, so well I mean we're starting to kind of plan the last uh episodes of the year and um I wanna get uh, I want to get a few more science episodes in, so um, I want to maybe look at, uh, you know, some sort of geology or geomorphology uh, episodes. So that's on the docket, and um, you know, if, if Falcon Heavy is something that that lands uh, in this year, I, I hope to to go down to Florida to see it and and produce some content there. Um, other than that, yeah, it's uh, that's kind of what's coming up, and then you know, next year is really exciting because uh, it's a Mars launch window, so we've got Insight heading out and. Uh, I want to get to that launch as well. So it could be a busy, uh, busy few months for me. Right. Okay. Well, uh, look forward to it. And uh, we'll have links in the show notes at unseenpodcast.com to Jake's podcast. And uh, I would hope you would, you can also follow him on Twitter. What you're at, at we Martians, right? Uh, Twitter is at we underscore Martians. At we, okay. Then, I'm uh, right now at we underscore Martians. Uh, and wemartians.com is your, your yeah wemartians.com you can blog. see uh, it's basically just uh, notifications of the new episodes and then some of the, the information for, for my Patreon uh, program which uh, some listeners are very generous to support me on so yeah you can head there uh, Twitter's my most active one but I also do uh, Instagram uh, you'll get a Mars picture every day if you go there that's just at wemartians and then if you're the type that does Facebook same thing at wemartians as well Okay, well, uh, folks, uh, if you're still listening, uh, can again go to go to Jake's sites that he just mentioned, or um, at uh, sorry, go to uh, unseenpodcast.com for the show notes of this episode. We'll have all kinds of things. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Nick Nielsen. Say good night, Nick. Oh. Good night, uh, Paul, and thanks, Jake, for showing up, and thanks for letting me on the show. And Adam Smith. Yeah, pleasure as always. Really nice to meet Jake, and really interesting to hear what he's had to say. And uh, also, uh, we've lost Sam Lichterstein, but he was here for a bit. And uh, this is your host, Paul Carr. Again, go to unseenpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can leave comments directly on the blog. Or you can come over to Google+. Plus. We have a listeners community. You can comment there. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, at Podcast Unseen. And uh, we no longer have the subreddit, but uh, th there are lots of ways to get in touch with us. You can even email unseenpodcast at gmail.com. So uh, here in the U.S., it is still the 6th of October, 2017. Uh, for Adam, it's the 7th. And... Uh, we uh, and thank you for listening to episode 80 with Jake Robbins. And this is the LC Podcast. And good night. Okay. Bye bye. Good night. <laughs>